Welcome, I'm Tracy Smith and this is Here Comes the Sun, a closer look at some of the people, places and things we bring you every weekend on Sunday morning. Sheila Johnson, BET co-founder and the first female African-American billionaire, shares both successes and struggles in a recent memoir, Walk Through Fire. Among her many business ventures is a luxury resort chain. As she tells Nancy Giles, building the first location in Middleburg, Virginia, was not without its challenges. It was not an easy road. Oh, no. In some ways, the town of Middleburg had welcomed her. But the thing that really bothered me was driving into town every day and seeing a Confederate flag in a gun shop. When I saw that flag, I said, God, where did I move to? Mm -hmm. You know, and I just decided to buy the building. And it's now a wonderful market. That's the beauty of having a little money. Later in the show, Sheila Johnson on the message she hopes readers take from her book. Walking through fire, all the women who walk through fire. It, is this book specifically for women or for everyone who might it's, have gone through that? This book is really for everyone. I want the women to start looking at themselves. I want them to realize their own power. For men, I want more respect. Looking at these women and giving them the room to grow. There's so many men that want to be controlling. Then, from a powerhouse businesswoman's story to celebrating female artists, the National Museum of Women in the Arts reopens in Washington, D.C. after a two-year, $70 million restoration. Rita Braver took a tour to explore its significance. And take this piece called The Springs by expressionist Lee Krasner. You know, if she's named, she's just called Jackson Pollock's wife. Correct. What's wrong with that? Everything's wrong with that because Krasner was as talented as her very famous husband. You see these sort of beautiful brush strokes, sort of grasses waving. You can imagine sort of any natural scene. That's all coming up right here on Here Comes the Sun. You might assume becoming America's first black female billionaire was fraught with obstacles, and it was. Sheila Johnson gives a step-by-step -step account of her path to success in her memoir, Walk Through Fire. Nancy Giles caught up with her at this serene slice of heaven she calls home. Just outside of our nation's capital, amid Virginia's rolling hills and picturesque stone walls, is a place that time seems to have forgotten. And I'll tell you, in the fall when the trees turn, it's just spectacular. I bet. Yeah. Oh, my God. The place Sheila Johnson calls home. When you first came out here, what did you think? This is where I needed to live. It feels like a sanctuary. Yes. Yeah. It is. She came here in 1996 to find refuge. At the time, BET, Black Entertainment Television, the company she and Robert L. Johnson had co-founded, was hugely successful, but their struggling marriage was the talk of the town. The rumor mill was off the chart. People would tell me, I saw them at the Super Bowl. Oh, I saw her come down in his shirt. And I said, I need a place where I can be alone, at peace. Right. Oh. And this is my secret garden. And you come out there in the mornings? That's where I have my coffee, yes. Yeah. Today, Sheila like Johnson that. is a very yeah. successful businesswoman and part owner of three sports teams. On wow. this wall are the championship <gasps> mystics. And you look like you've been crying. I have been. <laughs> the first black woman to make it into the very exclusive, very white, and very male billionaires club. And yet, she says, tongues are still wagging. You know, they look at me and they go, okay, you were so-called the first black billionaire and everything, and you've had it so easy. Oh. No, I haven't. Do people and pe say that? You've had it so easy? You have no idea. There's so many stories out there. They need to hear from me. Her book, Walk Through Fire, published by our sister company, Simon & Schuster, takes its title from the legend of the salamander. It's the only animal, mythically, that walks through fire and still comes out alive. It's also the name of her impressive collection of five-star luxury resorts. Hi, how are you? We joined Sheila Johnson as she welcomed guests to her flagship Salamander Resort and Spa in Middleburg, Virginia. 
for a weekend of good food and wisdom from some of the country's top chefs. This has been a marriage in culinary heaven. It's been 10 years since the doors first opened. It was not an easy road. Oh, no. In some ways, the town of Middleburg had welcomed her. But the thing that really bothered me was driving into town every day and seeing a Confederate flag in a gun shop. When I saw that flag, I said, God, where did I move to? Mm -hmm. You know, and I just decided to buy the building. And it's now a wonderful market. That's the beauty of having a little money. Getting the town's approval to build a resort was another matter. I thought I had left one fire. I jumped into a great big one, and I forgot I was south of the Mason-Dixon line. They came after me with all barrels, and uh, they signed petitions. We had hearings. I won by one vote. One thing to know about Sheila Johnson, giving up is not in her DNA. Your mom walked through fire in oh many ways. Oh, my goodness. Her life, you know, had a huge impact on me. Here she was at the top of the social circle as a woman as a mother married to a doctor. Theirs was an African-American success story, though that success was hard won. By the time she was 10, Sheila Crump had moved 13 times. We moved about every 10 months. Right, because of the work situations for your yeah, father, Yeah, because my right? father couldn't practice in white hospitals, um, and he couldn't even operate on white patients. Finally, her father got a permanent job in Chicago and they were able to buy a house and settle down. She took up the violin and excelled at it. And then, without warning, her father announced he was leaving the family. It brought us all to our knees because it was just one night, and he says, I'm leaving. Her mother had a breakdown. She had always been my backbone, and I was losing her. It just really kind of destroyed me in a way. And then I realized, this is Sheila, you know, you can't play the victim here. With the help of her violin teacher, she got a music scholarship to the University of Illinois, where she met an upperclassman named Bob Johnson. You were pretty young. Really young. Yeah. How about 16 and a half? What was your first impression of him? I was always looking for someone with ambition, but I was also going through something else psychologically because my father had left. I felt unloved. He wanted me. And because of him wanting me, I wanted him. Their marriage lasted for 33 years. I shouldn't have, I really shouldn't have let it go on as long as I did. I didn't want to be a failure. And I kept saying, I can, I can get through this. Mm -hmm. And I was really behind him. So much so that I got erased out of the picture. Their divorce was finalized in 2002. By coincidence or fate, the end of that chapter was the beginning of another. As I walked into the courtroom, I looked at the judge and I looked at my lawyer. I said, I think I know this guy. The guy was Judge William T. Newman, Jr. Many, many years ago, we um, happened to be in a play together. And <laughs> when the case was over, she said, excuse me, Your Honor, can I approach the bench? And I said, sure. I said, do you remember me? He goes, oh, yes, I do. <laughs> she invited him to a gala she was hosting. And I put on the invitation William T. Newman, Jr., and guest. Bill told his mother about it. I said, well, I guess I'll take so-and-so, who I just started to date. You were actually going to take someone else? Well, uh, yeah. <laughs> and my mother said, oh, no. You go to that party alone. Three years later, they married. A lavish wedding that was the social event of the season. And I said, I love this man so much, we are going to celebrate. We had 750 people at that wedding. It was, I have to say, the most beautiful wedding. It's a nursery. It is. These days, Sheila Johnson is looking forward, not back. And she has no intention of slowing down. I've come to reconcile the fact that we do need to walk through fire in order to come out stronger at the other end. Up next, an exclusive excerpt from Nancy's chat with Sheila Johnson, something you can only see right here on CBS News Streaming. Stay with us. The violin also gave me a safety net. 
during the time that my life was in a dark moment. As promised, here's more from Sheila Johnson and Nancy Giles. You played violin. Yes. I played viola, by the way. All right. What made you choose the violin? I don't know, <laughs> but I just love the feel of the instrument. I love the way it sounded. And I don't know why, but all my life, I, I tend to pick up the most difficult things to do. And so I started with the violin, mm -hmm. and I just fell in love with it. And from that point on, you know, I to this day, I still play. Oh, I so play glad. the cello. I took up cello during COVID. I just love music. Absolutely love music. It does. It enhances your life in so many ways. And, it really and does. All the qualities that you mentioned are things that you also continue to bring to the table. But you know what else? The violin also gave me a safety net during the time that my life was in a dark moment. You know, I would go to my violin. It would calm me down. It would make me feel better. Mm -hmm. Became my best friend, if you mm -hmm. want to know the truth. And I just love listening to the music. I remember my mother buying me a phonograph with all of the classical music. And I think to this day, I have it somewhere stored. Oh. But with just, you know, the records, she put the needle on. Records. And, yes, albums. the records, the yeah. albums. And I would just play them even when I was, you know, doing my homework. And I would go to the symphony, down to the Chicago Symphony, and listen to the symphony there. And I just love music. And again, classical music and African Americans, it, it's not a mix you always hear. No. Except there was always classical music and Motown music. You know, it, was, exactly. it really was there. So that was kind of a sort of a traditionally white space, I'd say, that you were really it integrating was, on your but own. But I did listen to. Motown, I listened to all, I could sing every record to you. I mean, I loved it. You know, I'm going to party too a little bit. <laughs> but I have to say that I just love music in general. Yes. I even love jazz. I remember going into college and just listening to Miles Davis, mm. Sketches of Spain. Mm -hmm. You know. It's all part of the piece. It's all part of it. And I just love music. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you had an incident that happened with another violinist that really hit me where yes. she's, t you want to tell what happened? Yes. I mean, for the past three years, I was always trying out for Illinois Allstate and mm -hmm. I would get like fourth chair or third chair or something like that. And then that's my senior year. I actually captured the concert mistress spot. Right. And I was always competing against this one person. And she says, you only got it because you're a and she said the N-word. Oh, nice. Yeah. Nice. And I said, you know what? I just grip my teeth, and I'm like, you're just going to have to deal with it. You've had you to know? deal with those things in, in many different ways, and you've done it with such grace and even humor. You have to, because if you stoop to their level, they come back at you. And I always want to be above board. Mm, mm. And I'm, one thing I've learned, when people say ugly, nasty things to you, you just look at them, and you be quiet. You just stare. Wow. It throws him completely off guard. If you saw pictures of my father, he's very fair. Mm. The people would second guess, but, you know. He could almost pass for white, but not quite. Yes. There was enough doubt. And believe it or not, that is still my world mm. to this day. And then as I've later learned that even in all cultures, you know, the fairer skins, it's, a, it's an issue. And even going into the media business, yep. it was always the fairer women got to be on camera. Right. The darker women were behind, behind the, the camera. camera. So this is a theme. I, I do continue to watch it. You know, I watch it even in my hospitality industry. I make sure that I want people of color at the front desk. I want them to visit my hotels. Mm -hmm. I want to make sure that people know I'm all about diversity and about everyone. Walking through fire, all the women who walk through fire. It, is this book specifically for women or for everyone who might it's, have gone through that? This book is really for everyone. I want the women to start looking at themselves. I want them to realize their own power. For men, I want more respect. Looking at these women and giving them the room to grow. There's so many men that want to be controlling. Mm. They want their women to be submissive. And that turns me off more than anything. I mean, I just think it's crippling. It's crippling for many women. And I just think when you marry someone on both sides, give each other room to grow 
and to be the better part of themselves because that's what makes a really strong marriage. Up next, celebrating women's art. Welcome back. Female artists have often historically received less consideration than their male counterparts, whether in art history textbooks or major museums. But for over 40 years, the National Museum of Women in the Arts in Washington, D.C. has amplified women's voices. Here's Rita Braver. It's been more than two years and almost $70 million. But at long last, the National Museum of Women in the Arts in Washington is relaunching. It's a great hall, um, but I never realized how much we could transform this space. And as museum director Susan Fisher Sterling explains, when this museum opened in 1987, it was the first in the world devoted exclusively to art made by women. An independent nonprofit organization, it was the vision of one woman. Wilhelmina Cole Holiday was a philanthropist and collector here in Washington, D.C. She had studied art history, and she was very much interested in the concept of beauty, which she talked about all the time. Sterling says that on a trip to Europe in the 1970s with her husband Wallace, Wilhelmina Holiday became fascinated by the work of 16th century Flemish painter Clara Pathers and wanted to learn more about her. But when Mrs. Holiday returned home... She could not find Clara Pathers. And what she realized also was there was not a single woman artist in that history textbook that was used across every university in the U.S. at the time. So the Holidays started collecting works made by women, eventually joining with other like-minded enthusiasts to purchase this then-abandoned building that had once been the D.C. headquarters of the Masons, where, ironically, women were not allowed. And the museum was controversial from the start. Because men critics didn't like the fact that there was such a museum, and the same could be said for many men artists. But also it was controversial because sometimes women felt that they didn't want to be segregated in a museum just for women. I think we've essentially beat that rap, if you will. In a sense, this place raised the profile of women artists. Yes. Has it ever? This is a group of uh, selections from our collection. We have about 6,000 objects. 6,000, wow. 6, important things. Curator is Catherine that? Watt showed us around newly imagined galleries, brighter, airier, and brimming with stunning works like Young Woman in Mauve by Impressionist painter Bert Morisot, who's often received less attention than her male counterparts. And take this piece called The Springs by expressionist Lee Krasner. You know, if she's named, she's just called Jackson Pollock's wife. Correct. What's wrong with that? Everything's wrong with that because Krasner was as talented as her very famous husband. You see these sort of beautiful brush strokes, sort of grasses waving. You can imagine sort of any natural scene. Today, the museum is packed with works by women who've gained international renown including photographers Berenice Abbott and Mary Ellen Mark, painters Georgia O'Keeffe and Amy Sherald, potter Maria Martinez, multimedia artists Judy Chicago and Nikki de saint -Fal. It's wonderful to come into the space and know that all of this work is made by women, and it's just really incredible to see the breadth of the work. Alison Saar makes prints and sculptures that focus on her biracial background and much more. I'm very interested in women and their lives and how we function within the world and even within our own world. Ta-da! Oh, yay! There she is. Fantastic. We were with Sar when she had her very first look at how her recent sculpture, Undone, is now on display. There's this elegant woman, and she has this lovely dress and behind this dress are all of these bottles that are closed up. 
You know, women were never given the opportunity to be who they wanted to be. So these are ideas these that are, are ideas, that dreams, didn't get made, and maybe never will. Yeah, that maybe never will. I mean, they're still there. I don't want to be too dark, but you know, yeah. So it's just a reality. This sculpture exhibit called "The Sky Is the Limit" features works like "Lady of Commerce" by Rena Banjeri, an American born in Calcutta, India. It's about colonialism and the impact of colonialism in terms of history. What are the forces that are driving business? What are the forces that drive politics? In fact, over the years, gender politics and protests by women artists have helped make a difference. And suddenly we are seeing yeah. women artists in major museums around the country. Yes. So do you really still need a place like this? Oh, I think so, because I think this museum for almost the past 40 years has had a tremendous impact in getting that conversation going and keeping it going. So while we're thrilled that other arts institutions are now picking up the mantle with us, we all need to keep the effort moving forward. There's a lot of work to be done. I'm Tracy Smith. Thanks for joining us. We'll see you here next time on Here Comes the Sun.